got to have a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of a Bible study tonight. So I want to, if I was going to give a name to the lesson tonight, it would be uh, you either stand with Israel or you stand with the devil. Right. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we love you tonight, and we have just prayed, and we shall continue to pray. And, uh, Father, we ask you now to bless your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the truth of your word. And help us to uh, uh, bring that out clearly and in such a way that would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn with me tonight, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 4. John chapter 4 and verse 24 says this, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. All right? God is a spirit. You know what all the other Bible versions say? God is spirit. They all remove the indefinite article A. A. One letter, one word, which is only one letter, and look at the difference that removing that one word, which is only one letter, a mere indefinite article as a part of speech, and it's the difference of God being a spirit or God being spirit. See? Because there's a whole lot of spirits, right? Yeah. So if, if all the other Bible versions that say God is spirit, they don't say God is a spirit. They say God is spirit. So if, the, if that's right, then could we say spirit is God? I <laughs> hope not. Amen. So that's why your King James Bible only says, doesn't just say God is spirit. It says God is a spirit as distinguished from and different from all other spirits. Amen? So we're dealing about with spiritual things, and God being a spirit, we want to be sure that the spirits we're listening to, the spirit that we're being led by, is God's spirit. Amen? So that means that uh, we need discernment, right? 1 John 4, verse 3. First John 4 gives us a little test. Look at verse 3. It says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is it in the world. So John tells us here that, uh, that among the other spirits that exist, there is a spirit of Antichrist, and that that spirit is already here in the world. And look what he says down in verse 6. He says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now go back to John chapter 8. In verse 47, 
Jesus said, He that is of God heareth God's words. And he told the Pharisees, Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. All right? So, we talk about discernment. We know over in Hebrews, it says that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Huh? Dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. Huh? Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. For all things are naked and open unto him with whom we, the eyes of him with, with whom we have to do. And then, while you're there in Hebrews, that was verse 4 and 12. Look at 5 and 14. You can actually back up to uh, verse 12. He says, Paul says, For when the time, yeah, Paul wrote Hebrews. Paul said, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat <clears throat> belongeth to them that are of full age, even the those who by what reason of use have exercised, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's your discernment again, right? And he says, he says, by reason of use, they've been exercised to discern good and evil. And this has to do with the words of God. Which Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And, and then he says, there's a group of people that don't hear those words. So they're listening to another spirit. And hey, they can be saved people. Saved people can be deceived too. We're not talking here specifically in where we're going with this, and I am going somewhere. But we're not talking about a salvation issue here, really. We're talking about what spirit you're listening to when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the Word of God. We discern by what the book says. Okay? That's the cut. That's where we have to be exercised, right? We've done all our curls. Huh? Done all our chest lifts. We've, we've exercised ourselves and we've become intimately, personally familiar with this book. We know the voice of the Lord. And when the voice of a stranger calls, we're like, uh, uh, right? So we know this. We know this. We're not, we're, we're, we, we don't discern by what tradition. We don't discern by what the early church fathers taught or believed. Why, why by, by 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, all those in Asia have turned away from me. So we see that there, even in Paul's time, there was a turning away from the truth. The truth which Paul clearly reveals in the Pauline epistles concerning dispensational theology concerning rightly dividing the word of truth discerning the difference between the church the body of Christ and the nation of Israel I got all kinds of cord hanging on me all right see there's a, there's a cut to be made there's a discernment to be made we need to know the difference and in Paul's time, you read Thessalonians, you, you read Romans, you can see clearly a distinction between the church, which is the body of Christ, and the nation of Israel. So, for a while, everybody was pretty on board with that. For a while, 
in the in the early church we talk about the writings of the early church fathers and for a while the theme this when I say uh, dispensational premillennial let me say this here's the theme that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth in person to Jerusalem, that he will sit on the throne of his father David, that he will rule and reign the earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem, and all of the Old Testament promises to the nation of Israel will be fulfilled in that time. Okay? That's the theme, all right? That's the theme that was understood, and it was understood by the early church fathers. Uh, the premillennial church fathers, which would include Barnabas, Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Lactacantus, Commodius, Victorianus, Methodist, the list of premillennial witnesses runs unbroken from about 120 A.D. to about 311 A.D. You read the church fathers, and they're premillennial. They're premillennial. He's coming back. He's setting up his kingdom. God hasn't thrown the Jews in the dumpster. All right? That, 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 witness, that witness is pretty consistent. All right? But what happens is, down in Egypt, a guy named Philo starts a school in Alexandria. And this school is a school, it's a secular school, it's a school of, uh, of, of Plato and the Greek philosophers of the time down in Alexandria of Egypt. It was conquered by Alexander the Great, that's the city is named after. It was a school of Greek philosophy, and Philo started it. But as a secular university, they studied many subjects and they were interested in all philosophy. So copies of, of the scriptures, they made their way down there. And uh, those scriptures were, were handled by, uh, uh, by a guy named Origen. And Origen got down there. And what Origen introduces that's different from what we've been looking at thus far, as far as a literal visible return of Christ to set up his kingdom, Origen introduces the allegorical method of study. Origen says, no, 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 that's all just symbolic, and it was all fulfilled in Christ's coming. That was just symbolic. So then along comes a guy named Aurelius Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, and he writes a book, all right? And he, uh, uh, Augustine writes a book called The City of God, and he wrote it somewhere between like 413 to 426. Ends up being 10 volumes. You can get a condensed volume if you like. But Augustine follows Origen's allegorical, symbolic school rather than the literal premillennial school, and it all becomes merely symbolic of something else. So uh, in his city of God, the Catholic Church, therefore, is identified as the new Israel. And this is the beginning of what we call replacement theology. So the Catholic Church is identified as new Israel, Covenant theology picks up on the same theme. We'll get into that a little bit more. Preachers faded into priests. Ordinances became sacraments. Justification by faith becomes salvation by works. The holy city becomes Rome. And this is where the Roman Catholic Church, uh, because it's coming through the Roman Empire, which, has, which, which is ruling much of the known world, and then the church grows up inside of that structure of the, of, the Ro of the Roman Empire, and it's under the philosophy of, I'm telling you, big, big, big uh, influence on everything that is Catholic is this Aurelius Augustine. And so... The Catholic Church picks up this theme that the church 
Everything that God promised Israel is symbolically and allegorical, allegorically fulfilled in the church. So God's done with Israel. Let me go into like 1,500 years of the Catholic Dark Ages. 1,500 years where nobody's allowed to read the Bible. All, all you get is what your priests are telling you in the church. There's no printing press. <laughs> there's, no, there's no Bibles. Nobody knows. The Catholic Church has a death grip on the truth for 1,500 years. And that whole time, what is being taught? No Old Testament. What they're being taught is that everything that all, all that was in the Old Testament, that's us. And now here's our priests and our sacraments, and it's just copying all the Old Testament stuff and applying it to the church. And the Catholic Church is God's avenue of grace to the world. It wasn't until the Reformation and the publication of the Geneva Bible and the King James Bible in England that Christians began to read the Jewish scriptures for themselves. In doing so, they began to believe once again the promises that God made to the Jews. See, once, once you and I, normal folks, got a Bible in their hand and started reading the Old Testament, they were like, hold on a minute. <laughs> God, God ain't done with these folks. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on. Put on the brakes. No, wait a minute. No, that, no, they ain't been telling us right. They haven't been telling us right. And uh, so we get to the Protestant Reformation. And there, is, there, and, and there begins to spark an interest in, in the Jews again, in premillennial Biblical, dispensational, rightly dividing. People start getting excited about the Bible. That's what, that was the whole thing of the rest, Reformation. Sola Scriptura, right? The, only the Scriptures, only the Scriptures. But then we go right from, right from the Reformation, and then we go into the, the be, much because of, uh, of what happens because of the Revel Re because of the Reformation. There's so many advances and 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 this veil of the Dark Ages and the Catholic Church's uh, uh, death grip on knowledge and learning and, and and any kind of advancement is pulled off and and man begins to flourish. I mean, medicine and science and education and people start learning to read because they, the Catholic Church's death grip has been removed. And then we get people get. They get full of themselves. They start educating themselves. This learning, learning begins to increase, and we come into the time of what they call the German rationalists. And the German, German rationalists now in the universities, now they come and they do the same thing. They come to the Bible just when people were starting to get interested in the Bible again, and the German rationalists come in and they say, and they, they, they begin to make it all symbolic. They begin to make it all allegory again. So it's really, it's really not until in America when we have the, the great awakenings, when we have the great revivals in America, and when you have guys um, that, that, that come along like Billy Sunday and R.A. Torrey, and, uh, and, and they, and they begin to have, uh, Bible meetings and they be having Bible campaigns and, and the missionary movement is birthed and people start getting back into the Bible. And they begin to see what the Old Testament says. They begin to rightly divide the church and Israel again. But this is the lie that they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that dispensationalism never existed. They're going to point you back to Origen and Augustine and the 
church fathers that use the allegorical method, and they say, look, this is what the church always believed. And any time, listen, any time you read church history, with very few exceptions, you're reading Catholic history. You're reading Catholic history. When people say the church, well, the church taught this, the church said this, the church believed that. What church? Well, the Catholic church. They were running the world. They wrote the histories. They, they wrote the history books. So you're getting a slanted view. But now as these, as these movements uh, uh, begin to come and, 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 and people start getting back into the Bible, but then the kickback is, they go. here's what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that rightly dividing dispensational theology, it started with a Scottish, Scottish clergyman named Edward Irving, who lived from 1792 to 1834, that he received his pre-tribulation rapture insights from a young Scottish lady named Margaret MacDonald, and later passed this doctrine on to John Nelson Darby. They try to get you to believe that dispensationalism really began then back in the 1830s. That's the lie. And that's, that's, what you'll, that's what you'll get from, from most of the pushback. If you're talking with somebody that knows anything about this, they said, no, no, nobody ever believed that. That started, that started in 1830 with, with Charles Nelson Darby and, and blah, 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 blah. That's, that's where they're going to go with that. Well, one thing they, they, they don't want you to see is uh, Ephraim the Syrian. Ephraim the Syrian uh, was a church father and... Uh, he, he wrote this somewhere between 306 and 374. This is Ephraim the Syrian. Here's what he said. For all the saints of and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come. They are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. That's Ephraim the Syrian. So when they try to tell you nobody ever even heard of a heard of a pre-tribulation rapture uh, uh, until uh, a Darby and them came along, that's just not true. And first, and first of all, it's in First and Second Thessalonians. So that's that's where your pre-tribulation rapture uh, originates is with the Apostle Paul in First and Second Thessalonians. But what's happened is it wasn't until the 1800s that that this truth was really kind of resurrected, was kind of resurrected because people had been under such bad teaching for so long that had passed on from the Catholic Church that the church is Israel. All this is just about us. It's all just about the church. There's no focus, no focus on a literal, a literal interpretation of what God said concerning the nation of Israel. It's all this is all for this. And, and the reformers, the reformers that came in, Martin Luther, John Calvin, hey, they didn't shake this off either. Look, at they brought, they brought about some very good stuff having to do with uh, justification by faith and coming out of a lot of, a lot of the Roman stuff. But this thing with Israel, they didn't shake that. They didn't shake that. Both Luther and Calvin wrote scathing hateful stuff about the about Jews and the nation of Israel. They never shook that mantle off. And so that's why you went into much of Protestant much of Protestant denominations and that's why they started with something called covenant theology. And when you talk to someone who's a Calvinist, you talk with someone who's a, a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Methodist and 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 many of these Protestant Episcopalian means Protestant denominations. What you're going to find in them is called covenant theology, and that's God made this covenant with man, and that when the Jews that did blew it, that God transferred that covenant over to the church, and that God has only ever had one covenant people, and that is, that's His church, and 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 the saved Jews are in it, and God is done. He meant nothing literal or physical with the nation of Israel. That's covenant theology, and most, most of your Bible colleges and seminaries in this country today, 
are going to teach you covenant theology. Most of the theologians, the ivory tower, doctor bottle stoppers, and doctor smell funguses that they put on these high pedestals with all the alphabet behind their name, most of them are going to go with this covenant theology thing because guess what? If they don't, they can't be in that club. Because they look at us people that just believe every single word of the book and think it's perfect and just believe God knew what He was talking about and meant what He said and said what He meant. And they think we're a bunch of dumb hillbilly hicks. Covenant theology. Replacement theology. God's done with Israel. The church is the new Israel. We're bringing in the kingdom. Can't you tell how everything's getting so much better already? Amen? Amen. All right. So, but with Darby around the 1800s, Darby gets, and, and there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of guys start getting it right around the 1800s, right? Guys, there's a bunch of guys that with the revivals in America, people got Bibles, they start getting excited, and uh, and and some really good teachers come on the scene, and Darby was one of them, and then come along a guy named C. I. Schofield, and uh, he writes the, the makes the Schofield Reference Bible, and he rightly divides this thing, and that that Schofield Reference Bible probably has the largest impact on this country and maybe on the world as far as, as bringing back to light dispensational, accurate, rightly dividing theology. And then a guy named Clarence Larkin comes out. And you guys have seen those, those very intricate, well-drawn uh, Bible uh, charts, those timelines, and that was all Clarence Larkin. He was a mechanical draftsman. He was actually a friend of C.I. Schofield. And he comes and he writes called Dispensational Truth is Clarence Larkin's book. And it's it's phenomenal. And Schofield hit this thing, hit this sweet spot on it. And Larkin comes along, he hits, this, he hits the sweet spot on it. And then Dr. Ruckman, he comes along, he picks up where Schofield and Larkin uh, left off. And, and, and he, hit, he hits, I mean, I tell you this thing, it, within Bible-believing church, this thing spreads, this thing spreads through the country. And now, and now you've got people, and then the 70s come along, and you've got like uh, Hal Lynn, Right in the great, great planet Earth, right? And then you got the Peretti comes out and he writes the Left Behind series, and you got people getting back on board with what the Bible says. And so uh, we begin to discern the words of God again. The world begins to discern the words of God again. So that brings us, that brings us now up to that's your history lesson. Done with the history lesson. That brings you to where we're at today. As we turn, you turn on the five o'clock news, six o'clock news, or whatever, you turn it on and you begin to look at what's happening in the world. You begin to look at what's happening in the Middle East. You begin to look at what's happening in our country. And I'm here to tell you 50% of college students in this country today side with the Hamas terrorists against the nation of Israel. They're marching in the streets against the nation of Israel. 50%. 50%. That's scary. That's scary. That's the next generation, my friends. That's the next generation. That's our future right there. So that kind of really makes where we're getting ready to go right now make a lot more sense. Amen? So when the Antichrist comes on the scene, right, we look in, in, in Revelation. What does he do? Let's go to Revelation. What's his, what's his mission? What's his game plan? What's his agenda? Revelation, we'll go to chapter 12 first. Now we talk about the allegorical method, right? The allegorical method of biblical interpretation, saying th everything is just symbolic, right? Listen, when the Bible is symbolic, the Bible is very clear about when it's symbolic. 
That you, you don't ever, ever have to look in the Bible and say, I wonder if this is symbolic or I wonder if this is literal. Because when the Bible's symbolic, you ain't going to miss it. This is symbolic. Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to deliver, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth, what? A man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Okay, stop right there. <laughs> who was the woman? <laughs> Israel. Amen? Who's the man-child? That's Jesus. Now it's symbolic, and it's obviously symbolic. It's obviously allegorical. <clears throat> Verse 6, and the woman, now here's what happens, right there at end of verse 5, bang, right? What, he was caught up to God in his throne. That's Jesus ascends. This same Jesus whom you see going up will in like manner return just like you see him growing up. All right, now look at from, from the period at the end of verse 5 to the and <laughs> in, uh, in the beginning of verse 6, is a parenthesis, is a gap of 2,000 years. Because look what happens. He gets caught up to the throne, and then now, now what happens? Look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there 1,203 score days, three and a half years, second half of the tribulation. And there was war in heavens. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more to heaven. And the great dragon, who's the dragon? Devil, Satan, okay? Look, when the Bible's symbolic, it's quite obvious what it's when it's symbolic. He said, that old serpent called what? The devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So what does he do? Look down at uh, uh, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the Jews, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hey, just the just testimony of Jesus Christ ain't going get to get you in the tribulation. Tribulation, you have to keep the commandments of God too. Why? Because the church is gone. The, the church age is over. Now we're in the tribulation and God's dealing with the Jews again. Something's changed. All right. So, Antichrist, agenda, smash out the Jews. Pretty simple, right? Antichrist, he wants to kill who God loves, and that's God's people, right? So then turn over a couple pages. Chapter 16. Chapter 16, uh, we'll read... 12, 12 through 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to what? Gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Amen. And behold, he says, behold, I come as a, a, a thief, Wait. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This Antichrist gathering the whole world in the valley of Megiddo, this is right outside of Jerusalem, to come in and smash out the Jewish people. Look at Matthew chapter 24.
And we get, Jesus gives us the whole rundown on that right here. Matthew chapter 24. Start, uh, start in the first verse. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to uh, show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Huh? <laughs> Take heed that no man deceive you. Don't let him tell you Israel's the church. Huh? Don't, don't let him tell you God's done with, with the nation of Israel. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Huh? Pope, Papa. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake." Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jews. And, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's what we're seeing in our universities today with our young people. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. People say that verse is somebody losing their salvation or you got to get to the end of your life to be saved. No, he's talking about this period of time when this is going on and if you make it to the end, you ain't going to die. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto nations. When you therefore shall see the abomin abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand, take it literally. Then let them which beware in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him that is on the housetop not come down. Amen. Look at verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on what? The Sabbath day, huh? the buildings of Israel, Judea, the Sabbath day. This is, he ain't talking to church age people. He's not talking to the body of Christ. He's talking to Jews in the tribulation. That who? That the Antichrist has come with the armies of the world to destroy God's people, the Jews. So, if you're anti Semitic, if you don't stand with Israel, you're operating under the spirit of the Antichrist. Because Satan is the god of this present world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. We've got a whole nation of young people out there waving signs in the streets, tearing up stuff in the spirit of the Antichrist coming against God's chosen people. And so here's what people say. Here's what they'll tell you now. They'll tell you, well, the Jews ain't God's chosen people anymore because they rejected Christ. Bible says, Bible says that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the the testimony of Jesus Christ, he that he that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming flesh is of God, and anybody else, they're, they're antichrist because they don't receive Jesus Christ. Look and look at them. Look at the, the sodomy and what they stand for. Look at look at Israel. They're not cho God's chosen people. They're wicked. They don't believe in Jesus. Well. Those people didn't read much of their Old Testament because the Jewish people have been on this yo-yo since their inception. They serve God for a while, then they go serve Baal. They serve God for a while, then they go serve Baal. They serve God for a while, God lets some bad stuff happen and gets their attention. Yeah, I mean, it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's the pattern. That's what's going on. God's not done with them. Listen, God's, God's covenant to God, His people, to the nation of Israel, was eternal, one-sided, and unconditional. And no matter how many times they messed up, 
God brought them back. And he's still bringing them back. Now, how does that happen? Okay, we just we were just talking about what Jesus says. Look at <laughs> when you see all this coming to pass, you're in Judea, head for the hills, hope it in on the Sabbath day. Why? Because it's Jewish. You, you're not allowed to go only a certain amount of miles walking on the Sabbath day. He's talking to Jews. So, yeah, be, be, be sure, <laughs> hope it on the Sabbath day because you ain't going to be able to run far. But look at Joel chapter 3. This is this this is stuff people got people started getting a hold of a Bible. <laughs> this is stuff they, they went back and they started to read and they're starting, hold on a minute. <laughs> hold on a minute. This ain't happened yet. God's not done with these folks. Joel chapter three, verse one. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. They've cast lots for my people. They've given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might have drink. Let me look at verse down to verse 9. Procl proclaim ye this, among the Gentiles. What? He said all nations. Remember that back in verse 2? So I'm going to gather all nations. Remember that. All. When God said all, says all, he means all. <laughs> Amen. Proclaim ye this among who the Gentiles. We'll go, we're going we're gonna to touch on that again in a minute. Remember that. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. That's kind of backwards from the other place. They said, <laughs> beat all your swords into pruning hooks. No, here, here we're getting ready to shed some blood. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves. Come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there, says the Lord, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Amen. Verse 14, multitudes. Multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Verse 16. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be Holy. God ain't done with Israel. God ain't done with Israel. You get some, you get some guys like Origen and Augustine, and they say, well, this was just all symbolic of what Jesus did on the cross. <laughs> all right. Now, when this all happens, remember he said, I'm going to gather all nations. All nations. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38. Now, start verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against... Now, start remember some of these names, because they're going to come up again when we go to the next place. Gog and the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophecy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, uh, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. He says, so I'm going to bring them down. We just said that. God's going to bring them down to this valley of decision. Uh, five. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shields and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Torgarma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. 
Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and, and, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come, what? Into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is now brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So here we got, we see this, uh, uh, who the Antichrist is going to gather. Who the Antichrist is going to gather. And of course, you can identify uh, Persia is Iran, Ethiopia and Libya. Of course, that's obviously, those are the North African Islamic nations. But now, go with me to Genesis chapter 10. Let's, let's see if we can identify some of these other folks. Some of these other, some of these other folks. Amen? Amen. Now, Gen in, over here in, in, in around Genesis chapter 10, uh, we see that uh, Noah and his three sons, well, they got off the ark, right? And uh, shortly after that, of course, there's the, um, there's the Tower of Babel with, where everybody gets separated. But Noah and his three sons, they begin three racial groups, all right? And so you got, you got Ham that goes south, African. You've got Shem who goes to the east and becomes Asian or Oriental. You've got Japheth which goes to the north and becomes the Caucasian, the European. All right? And so look at, look at chapter 10 right here. Um, and verse, let's start in verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth. See if any of these names sound familiar to you. Japheth, the one that went north, European. Gomer, and Magog, Madai, and Japhan, and what? Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus. And what? The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rifta, Togarma. <laughs> Amen. Hey, and, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, and Kittim, and Dodanim. Look at this verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongues, after their families, in their nations. Those are the same guys. Those, those are the same guys, right? These aren't necessarily nations. What we're talking about here is people groups. People groups. The defendants of JPEth, the European, if you will, right? And where, where, where are we? <laughs> Australia, Canada, United States, England, Europe, right? And God says that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to bring all nations. We don't miss out. We've fallen right into the same mess. We come in with the Antichrist. When I say we, I don't mean we as the body of Christ, because guess what? We're not here anymore. Huh? Because in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, hallelujah, the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Paul says that we, the body of Christ, are not appointed to wrath. Amen. That we are out of here before all this takes place. But here's the thing. You see already, 50% of college students in America are ready to go destroy Israel right now. What do you think is going to happen when we're gone? Huh? Because for the most part, unless for listen, I'm not saying this is not a salvation issue. We get to heaven, there are going to be some really stupid saved people. 
<laughs> they go, we're going to be in eternity with some real dumb dumbs. I'm just saying, you know, that didn't understand what the Bible said. That didn't believe what the, what, what, anything about rightly divided. Didn't anything about dispensationalism. Didn't know which Bible was the scripture. I mean, it's not a salvation issue. It don't, it don't take a whole lot to get saved. I'm praise God because, uh, hey, if a dummy like me could get saved, anybody could get saved. Amen. So we're going to be up in heaven with a, a whole bunch of folks who, uh, did not get what this book said here. And listen, over there in Second uh, John, John says this, be careful. He said, be careful that you lose not what you have wrought, that you lose not your reward. We're not talking about salvation, but we're talking about the quality of life in eternity after we go through the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. I don't look forward to the judgment seat of Christ. Some people are like, oh, I can't wait to go get my crowns. I want my jewels. I want my rewards. Listen, <laughs> I, guarantee, I guarantee I've lost a lot more than I've ever, that I've ever earned. Amen. No, it's, they, said that, they said that's a time of fear. It's a time of fear. You're going through the fire. You know, they talk about Jesus in the book of Revelations. And it says, I, his eyes were as a flame of fire. They talk about the fire that we go through. I think that's enough fire for me, huh? Can you imagine? To, to, to stand before the Holy Lord who gave His life for you and for me and to look in those eyes with everything. Listen, that's the one who was there when you did that thing that you never told anybody about. He was there when you had those thoughts that you would never have shared to another person. He was there. He knows everything about you and you got to look Him in the face on that day. Boy, that's enough fire right there. It'll all be tried by fire. Amen. Amen, amen. But when that's that's we're going, we're in heaven, and that's when all of this, all of this is happening on the earth to the nation of Israel. And the Antichrist is gathering all the nations, and look, you can see it already. The spirit of Antichrist is stirring up this anti-Semitism. It's stirring up the whole world against the Jews right now. And there's only one thing holding them back, and that's us. The light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And brother, I'm telling you, when we go up, this place gets so dark, the parents are gone, and the kids are going to run amok. And that's when it's all going to happen. That's when it's all going to happen. But we are a safety valve here until that time. God talks about that in the book of Romans. This is, uh, I got one other place after this, which just feeds into this, but this is our, this is our really, this is where this thing ends up. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Apostle Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What you not that the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time, when he's writing it, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, at that certain time, there were Jews getting saved. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached, and 3,000 Jews got saved. This is, this is the election of grace. They came, they came right into the body of Christ. They joined the church. This was the beginning of the church in Jerusalem. Verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that 
which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now Paul's talking about in his day, those Jews that did accept Christ in that day. That was the election. And what? The rest, the rest of Israel was blinded. Okay? And guess what? They've been blinded for 2,000 years. But watch. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, unto this day. As people say, well, the Jews, they don't believe in Jesus, and they're wicked. God knows that. God knows that. <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of His program. He wrote all about it right here in Romans chapter 11. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Jews have had a rough time. God knows that too. They're stubborn. <laughs> but watch. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. What? To provoke them to jealousy. Hey, somebody you're done with, you ain't trying to provoke to jealousy. Now, verse 12, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, that means jealousy, them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Paul's trying to get Jews saved back then. But now, look at verse 17. He breaks off into a bigger picture. And if some of the branches were broken off, the Jews, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, the Gentiles, and with them partaketh of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, replacement theology, covenant theology, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. Now God's not talking to individual personal Christians about their salvation. He's talking to Gentiles and their opportunity in the church age to be saved by grace through faith. And he says this, 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise, Gentiles, thou also shall be cut off. And they also if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. He's going to wrap it up. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, Israel, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not Brethren, that ye should be ignorant of what? This mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's a day when the opportunity for the Gentiles to be saved by grace through faith is not going to be there anymore. The time of the Gentiles will have an end, and the end of that time is the rapture of, of the body of Christ, is when the church ends and we're out of here, the church age is over, and God turns back 
to restore the natural branches, to restore the nation of Israel again. And verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion 